Today is Friday, April 9th, 2021. Mark Harding and I are, are here today with the Honorable Arthur E. Gamble. We are in our gorgeously restored courtroom in the Polk County Courthouse, for which he is partially responsible. Judge Gamble was appointed a Fifth District Court Judge in 1983, became its Chief Judge in 1995, a position he held until taking senior status in 2018, 35 years of serving the people of Iowa. We have many other areas to cover with Judge Gamble, but first, let's talk about what surrounds us today, Judge Gamble. How did this come about? Well, as you indicated, I became chief in 1995, and I uh, recall writing a letter to the Polk County Board of Supervisors in 1995, uh, uh, telling the board about the uh, difficult and decrepit condition of the Polk County Courthouse back then and suggesting at that time that uh, remodel or reconstruction or new facilities uh, would be necessary. And uh, that became a project uh, uh, throughout the course of my career as the chief uh, with uh, many fits and starts and uh, different political uh, priorities and things that uh, delayed uh, construction for decades literally decades. We had a bond issue that didn't quite make it. We did. We had, uh, uh, when, when it became the court's turn, uh, after the construction of the new jail, after the construction of the event center, and the, the county uh, turns, it turns its attention to the courts, uh, we uh, did some uh, focus groups and community surveys and meetings with the community to uh, develop a plan for the new court facilities and it was determined uh, by the community that the best option at that time was a uh, new, totally new courthouse to be constructed on the parking lot uh, to the south of the building. Uh, and I remember that you attended some of those uh, yes. sessions. And so uh, an architect was retained and a, a plan was developed and the price tag was established and we took that to the voters and it was defeated. And the opponents uh, of the bond issue uh, primarily uh, based their opposition on the fact that we were not using existing county-owned facilities. And so in defeat, we adjusted our plan and our timeline. Uh, and we determined uh, that we would uh, use uh, county facilities. At that time, the county owned uh, what is now the Wellmark uh, YMCA. Wellmark owned the uh, J.C. Penney's building, so they did a land swap so that the county could acquire the J.C. Penney's building. Uh, and uh, ultimately what occurred was uh, construction, approval of a bond issue, and construction of a court facility in the J.C. Penney's building, uh, formerly the Wellmark uh, office building, and uh, uh, the superstructure and foundation of the county jail became a criminal courts building. Uh, the the uh, J.C. Penney's building became a uh, magistrate's court, traffic court, and juvenile court facility uh, that also houses the county attorney's office and juvenile court services. And then this building, well, we're in the process of restoring it for the civil courts and family law. Quite a project, and one you ought to be proud of, I think, it's turned out very well. But we'll come back to that sort of in our timeline as things go, but let's, let's uh, start with your family life as, as growing up. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about your family life and uh, growing up in Des Moines, Iowa? Well, I was born uh, December 21st, uh, 1952. Uh, my father was John Gamble, and uh, he was an attorney uh, in the Gamble Law Firm and had various uh, names, uh, trade names through the years. Uh, and uh, I had two brothers, my oldest brother, uh, John, uh, recently passed away, and then my uh, next brother is Robert, uh, Bo Gamble. Uh, and uh, Bo uh, attended the uh, University of Iowa uh, College of Law and came back to practice law in the, the Gamble Law Firm in 1962 uh, when I was about uh, 10 years old. Uh, so I uh, followed in his footsteps and, and attended Iowa and, and came back to the firm in uh, 19. 78. To me, you've, uh, watching you all these years, you've always wanted to be a judge, I think. Is that true? 
Well, uh, I don't know if, if I always wanted to be a judge or if I ever thought that was even possible. But my uh, grandfather uh, in uh, Alabama was a circuit court judge, the equivalent of a district court judge here. Uh, and my uncle my, was uh, also uh, a circuit judge in uh, southern Alabama. Yeah, and, and prosecutor, as I remember. Yes, he was a prosecutor before he went on the bench. Um, and so there, that was just part of our, our family uh, history. Uh, and my mother really was the one that uh, encouraged me to consider a career in the judiciary. Uh, for whatever reason, maybe she thought my personality was more suited to that than uh, 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 the private practice of law. And she encouraged me, and, and so, uh, yeah, in the back of my mind as I uh, uh, practiced law, I thought maybe at some point in time I'd well, try for that. Besides your parents, were there other people, who, and Bo, of course, were there other people who influenced you, or uh, thought you'd be good at being a judge, or thought you should be a lawyer? Well, I think the first one that really kind of came up with the idea uh, might have been Chris Green, who was a trial attorney in the, in the Gamble uh, law firm at the time. And uh, he challenged me and also uh, convinced me that uh, I should apply for a judgeship. Well, you had a brief career with the Gamble law firm, about five years. Uh, I remember doing a case with you then, uh, right. what was called the Carmack Amendment, uh, damage to uh, property being transported by rail. Uh, the Gamble firm had a, what I'd call a railroad practice, right. uh, represented more than one railroad? Well, the, the history of the Gamble law firm was that my great uncle, my, my, uh, my dad's uncle, J.G. Uh, Gamble, uh, after whom I have named my son uh, Joe, oh. uh, was uh, an attorney in the law department of the Chicago Rock Island Pacific Railroad in, out of Chicago. And he uh, led the uh, Iowa division of the uh, Rock Island Law Department here in Des Moines and started what became the Gamble Law Firm. I see. Uh, his brother was the judge in Alabama, and uh, J.G. sent my dad uh, to law school at, and paid for his way at Harvard Law School in the 20s. I'll be darned. Uh, and he came back to practice uh, with his uncle. Uh, and. Uh, so the Gamble Law Firm was historically uh, counsel to the Rock Island. And in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, yeah. the Gamble Law Firm merged with... Davis uh, Johnson, Burton Davis. Frank Davis's law firm, and they had uh, the Chicago, Chicago uh, uh, Northwestern Transportation Company as their main client. So it became sort of a transportation firm and when I came to the firm as an associate, uh, I did a lot of work for both the Rock Island, uh, which was in bankruptcy at the time, uh, and uh, the Northwestern, and, and uh, gained a lot of uh, tremendous experience doing that, particularly with the Rock Island. Uh, because they were in bankruptcy, they weren't paying top dollar to their <laughs> highest uh, caliber lawyers, and I got to do a lot of cases with the Rock Island. <laughs> Well, uh, I would also, never underestimate yourself that way, but yeah, I get it. Um, a young lawyer, they didn't have to pay as much. Uh, okay, uh, let's talk a little bit. You went to the University of Iowa uh, for undergraduate, right. and then went to law school, uh, graduated in 1975. And graduated then, from college in 75, and, and law school in 78. 78. Excuse me, yes, and then in 1983, five years later, you uh, applied to be a judge. That's true. And uh, were you successful the first time? Yes. And uh, there's sort of a story about that. I guess uh, that your competition was what I'd call a good old boy, and uh, Governor Branstad decided he didn't want any of that and uh, picked you at, the, at a very young age. How old were you? 30. 30 years old, which uh, I think thought, some people thought might be too young. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to agree with that. Well, somehow you uh, survived that. And, I did. Uh, and your first assignments in the 5th Judicial District, as I remember, was in the southern part of it. Well, I applied for a uh, vacancy uh, in uh, Judicial Election District 5A, which included Polk County at the time. Uh, and the vacancy was from uh, Maynard Hayden when Maynard went up to the uh, Court of Appeals. Mm. And Maynard was from Indianola. and, and uh, when he was here, he was chief judge and 
was in Polk County most of the time, and I didn't know the difference really. Uh, but when his vacancy occurred, it was in uh, the rural part of 5A, not in Polk County. And so I did, uh, I did my uh, years in, uh, in 5A and 5B, Southern Iowa. And to explain to the viewer who might not know, the 5th Judicial District goes all the way to the southern border of Iowa. So right. you, you were uh, down in uh, like Ringgold County and uh, uh, in, in Decatur County, and right. which is a long haul drive from, uh, from right. Des Moines. But you had to, you had to get up in the morning and make it there for court, yeah. court days. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, and 1983, in the southern district, uh, southern part of the uh, uh, fifth judicial district, put you in the midst of the farm crisis. Yes. And can you tell us a little bit about that and and how that affected being a judge? Well, first of all, I was a city boy, uh, born and raised in Des Moines, and uh, and attending the University of Iowa. Did not have a lot of exposure to uh, agriculture, um, agricultural law, commercial law as it applies to agriculture or the farm community. So it was a, a huge adjustment for me to uh, suddenly be uh, a, a judge in, in uh, rural Iowa. Uh, the farm crisis was a very depressing period of time in Southern Iowa. Uh, and the banking practices were lax, uh, to say the least. It, and that came back to bite both the banks and the farmers uh, when uh, the farm crisis occurred and uh, 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 there was a series of uh, mortgage foreclosures. So I uh, kind of got caught in the middle of all of that uh, and uh, gained a lot of experience in commercial law in a, in a mm. short period of time. Uniform Commercial Code came to you. Eh? It did, and uh, farm foreclosure law. Yeah, I'll well, bet. Yeah. Um, were there, did you ever feel physically threatened by any of, of that going on? Well, I, I, there were occasions in my time in the rural courts where I not only felt physically threatened, but I was physically threatened. But I don't think it was related to the farm crisis as much. Uh, there was a lot of tension, don't get me wrong. Uh, but uh, no, I did not have uh, threats of violence or anything like that that some of the other uh, judges may have experienced during that, okay. that time. And uh, at some point, you, the, the, you, were, you got to do more work in Polk County? Did, did that come about? Well, when I applied for the uh, position as a judge in Judicial Election District 5A, Chief Judge Lavarado brought me down to the Polk County Courthouse. And he said, you know, I just, I just want to tell you that uh, this is a country judge position that you're applying for. I'd already been nominated by that time. So there was no backing out at that point. And I just want to tell you that this is what uh, your assignment's going to be. Uh, but I also give you my word that I will do everything I can to uh, get you into Polk County at some point in time in the future, because I was a resident of Polk County. And what happened was the uh, legislature created uh, Judicial Election District 5C, which was Polk County, and provided by law that uh, judges had to reside in the election district where they served. Uh, and there was no uh, grandfather clause. So that created some problems because I had just purchased a house in Polk County, uh, but I was serving in what became 5A, the rural courts. Conversely, another judge who served in Polk County actually resided in Warren County in 5A. So there needed to be some uh, accommodation. Uh, and Lou, true to his promise, uh, lobbied the legislature, probably took uh, maybe a couple of years anyway to get this done, but we got an amendment to the law uh, to grandfather in the Polk County judge who lived in Warren County and to provide that uh, uh, I could uh, come into Polk County as vacancies occurred. Actually, it was both me and by that time, uh, Judge Levine had moved to Polk County but was serving in 5A. So he got the first slot as seniority goes, and then uh, eventually uh, I succeeded uh, Judge Donato in, in uh, Election District 5C. And that was in the late 80s, early, early 90s. Okay, now I, we could talk about important cases e either by 
when you were a, before you became chief judge, but maybe we ought to wait and talk about important cases altogether at some point. So let's let me move on, if I can, to your appointment then as chief judge, which, uh, as you said, indicated in 1995. And did you replace uh, Judge Moore? Was it I did. Chief Judge Moore? I did. So when I was a rural judge, after Judge Laborato was appointed to the Supreme Court, Judge Moore was the chief. And Judge Moore was a rural judge in 5B uh, out of Sheraton, Lucas County, Iowa. And he had an office uh, here in the courthouse. It was in room three, 305 down the hall from where we sit today. Uh, and uh, since I was a resident of Polk County, when I had uh, ruling days or time away from the bench, I had an office in the courthouse as well. And it turned out it was the same office. So <laughs> Judge Moore and I moved uh, two desks head to head in uh, chambers of uh, 305. And we shared that office space for several years uh, and that was quite an experience. The Marlboro he, man is I think. He was uh, definitely the Marlboro man, literally a uh, smoker in the, in the office, which there's a funny story about that. I'll tell it in a second, but okay. uh, he was, you know, a, a rural conservative uh, Republican judge, hard-headed, hard-nosed, smart as can be, uh, and I wasn't. So, uh, he and I uh, butted heads quite a little bit in those uh, years uh, when we shared office space. And but came to respect each other. I think so. I respected him, and I think he came to respect me. And assist, uh, he, he named me as an assistant chief uh, at some point in time after I came into uh, Polk so that I was uh, able to assist him in administration of the, of the district and act in his absence when he was gone. So Polk County uh, decided at some point in time that there would be, they would stop, they would ban smoking in the courthouse. <laughs> and uh, Dick didn't stop smoking in our office. And so one day when he was gone, I got the, a copy of the resolution that the Board of Supervisors had passed. And I uh, framed it and did it in the big red letters. <laughs> and we had a bulletin board between our two desks and I stuck it on the bulletin board. Uh, you know, this means you basically is what I was saying. So when he came back, I guess he really hit the ceiling. It was pretty funny, but he did stop smoking in the office after that, uh, as he should have. And, and eventually that, that became the, uh, the policy district-wide. Um, and then the other thing that happened uh, during that period of time is uh, the uh, flood of 1993. Mm. Dick put me in charge of our response to the flood because he was in Sheraton at the time. And, decided that was Polk County problem and you Polk County guys need to take care of that and he just <laughs> said take care of it. So as the assistant chief I managed uh, that crisis so we closed the courthouse down, moved all of the records of the clerk's office out of the basement into, into a more secure. Was the basement flooded? The basement was flooded, at least part of it was. Mm. And in order to uh, secure the basement we used uh, inmate labor from Polk County Jail which was across the street. So I went over to the jail to talk to the sheriff to negotiate this, and the power was out. And uh, there were no windows in that building uh, in the administrative offices of the sheriff's uh, division over there. Pretty hot. So I went in there, and literally the only light that anybody could see in the sheriff's off inner office there was the uh, light at the end of Sheriff Rice's cigarette. <laughs> And we'd sat there in his office and negotiated how we could get inmates to help us move the records out of the basement and secure the courthouse with sandbags and so forth. And we managed all of that. We established a uh, temporary court facility in a uh, building owned by the Des Moines Police Department on the east side. And because it was important to me that the courts remain open and not be shut down by anything, na natural disaster or anything else. And so we managed that. We had our jail court. Uh, over in the, in the police building and, and we got through the crisis. Uh, eventually Dick came back and we eventually reopened the, uh, the courts after the flood was over. Wow. All right, so uh, the chief justice who appointed you as chief judge would have been Lavarado? Actually it was uh, Chief Justice McGivern. McGivern, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And uh, that began uh, a long term uh, from till 2018, yes. uh, quite a while. Right. And um, I think 
in my opinion, not all judges are very good at administrating, but to have that quality as a judge is something you really uh, uh, need, uh, be, and particularly in the busiest uh, district in the, in the state of Iowa. And so we, we really need to talk about all the kind of things you did as chief judge. Where would you like to start? Well, I didn't have any expertise or training in administration when I became chief judge. Um, I had uh, trained uh, kind of at the knee of Judge Moore, and uh, so when I became chief, uh, we, I kept the same uh, district court administrator, uh, Gary Ventman, and uh, we, uh, uh, we just managed, uh, basically, we managed by crisis. Um, but one of the things that uh, I didn't agree with uh, Judge Moore about all the time was his uh, management style. Uh, and in those days, the courts were authoritarian and uh, monolithic. Uh, and, and Dick ran the courts that way. He was the chief, and everybody did what he decided we would do. Um, although he did have a, a some ad hoc committees and did take some input from, from various people, but it wasn't organized. Uh, and we were having, in the mid-90s, a lot of problems uh, in the administration of our district associate courts in Polk County. And the uh, judicial branch brought the National Center for State Courts in to examine the administration of uh, our district associate courts and suggested, and suggested that we do a total quality management type of thing uh, for those courts, which Dick was just not going to do. So when I became chief, I decided to go all in on that, and not only did we do that for the district associate courts, we did it district-wide, and we created what we called a quality management council, which was a kitchen cabinet of judges and, and line staff and supervisors to meet and, and provide advice and counsel to me and to carry out projects and different areas of, of the administration of the courts, whether it would be security or fine collection or administration of the rural courts or administration of the criminal courts or just the organization of the courts in general. And uh, we did that for several years. Uh, Judge Reed uh, was involved in that and uh, Judge Pilly was in charge of it. He was my assistant chief. And then, of course, I was the chief, so they were advising me. Uh, but I also did provide them with some direction of things that I'd like to see them do. And one of the things I really wanted to do was reorganize the uh, Polk County Criminal Courts, uh, which in, in the old days uh, were uh, organized differently than they are today. And I thought it, that there should be a, a better way of doing things. And so and Tell it, us what the better way was. Well, here. in those days, um, couple things about it is the, there was criminal number one and criminal number one was really a powerful position in, in the, the Polk County criminal justice system because everything went through criminal number one um, and the volume of, of cases was such that that was you could do that um, so that was an administrative court where all of the arraignments uh, guilty pleas sentencing probation violations um, and uh, trial informations, everything went through there. And that judge ruled the roost for the year that the judge was on criminal number one. Then the judge went from criminal number one to criminal trials for at least two years, maybe longer. And so you were away from the civil docket for those three years. Then you went to family law for another year. So you were away from the civil docket for four years. And by the time you came back, the law had evolved or you forgot everything you ever knew. And I didn't, didn't think that was the right way to go. And I also didn't think that all of the power needed to be in one place in uh, that uh, criminal uh, administration. So I asked the Quality Council to look at that and they developed a, a plan to decentralize some of that work out of what is still probably called criminal number one uh, so that the trial judges could manage their cases after the arraignment, basically, or the first pretrial conference. The trial judges would manage all of the uh, uh, hearings and all of the case, all of the proceedings leading up to trial 
in the A and B felonies and the forcible felony cases. So the more serious cases that more likely went to trial had previously been managed up to the trial date, trial date by criminal number one, but now we're being managed uh, by the trial judges. And I thought that was a much more efficient way to go. And then uh, as time went on with the caseloads continually increasing, uh, we added a fourth criminal trial docket that focus, focused uh, exclusively on the pretrial proceedings of uh, drug cases. So we call that a felony drug docket. Uh, and of course then we needed space for all these uh, new judges and new courts that were coming along. So that was the next thing that we had to do. Uh, uh, first we created courtrooms and space previously occupied by the Sheriff's Department on the second floor. Then we created uh, offices in, in courtrooms and space previously occupied by other county offices and the county attorney's office and the courts eventually expanded to the point where he kicked everybody out everybody else was out <laughs> and all of the courts were in the Polk County Courthouse yeah. and then we continued to grow and continued to expand and that became problematic because we ran out of space okay and so the other part of seems to me always, in, in my opinion, particularly about the civil docket, but probably also for the criminal docket is your docket moves a lot better if people know they're going to go to trial if they don't resolve the case ahead of it. Is, is that your experience as a judge? Definitely. I and mean, that, that's a carryover from Judge Moore. He instilled in me that nothing settles a case better than a good firm trial date. I can still hear him say it. And it's absolutely true. So under my administration and his before me, um, we, we focused on case management by putting together a docket of cases, and you had to have a judge, a courtroom, a court reporter, a court attendant, and a firm trial date in order to have uh, credibility in the assignment. Uh, and no case could be, the judges could continue their cases as necessary uh, within their discretion as circumstances arose. But in terms of administration, no cases would be bumped. There would be no standby cases. Every case was uh, first off, lead off. Every case was going to go. Uh, and then if a judge had, uh, was double booked, uh, the case would be reassigned on the morning of trial to somebody else. But it was going to go to trial. And through that method of case management, uh, we whittled through a huge backlog of cases uh, down to a manageable um, docket, but it, it took several years to do. Well, as, as someone who just did civil litigation, I think you're absolutely right. That's certainly what makes civil cases go away is a, is a firm trial date. You either, either settle it or you try it and, and keep moving that way. Right. And I think that right. was good. What about the juvenile court system? Uh, the juvenile court system really evolved uh, during the time that I was the chief. Uh, I was the uh, direct line supervisor to the chief juvenile officer in the uh, later and later times became the appointing authority and the firing power too, too but, but I was the, the supervisor of the chief juvenile court officer which was always Gary Bentley yeah. uh, back in the day and then when Gary became um, district court administrator it was Bert on it and Bert oh, yes. was the chief juvenile officer for years uh, and uh, Bert finally retired and we hired Marilyn Lance, uh, and uh, so on it went. But uh, part of that, if I, the juvenile court system uh, really needed some attention, I think, when you got here. It was, uh, I served as a volunteer in juvenile court judge with Judge La when Chief Judge Lavarado was here. And I think it, you can explain to us maybe a little bit. There's a census taken of number of cases in every district by the Supreme Court and then there's a rebalancing of how many judges you get uh, based on that and uh, you were able to uh, do some uh, pretty fancy negotiating about that. Uh, I did. Can you tell us how all that worked? Well, I mean our, our population in central Iowa continued to grow and with that the conflict and, and crime continued to occur. Uh, so our caseloads uh, grew and uh, we needed more space and we needed more judges to deal with the increase in cases. And that was just a fact. That's, that's what happened. So, uh, you know, the state of Iowa is a rural state. And there was a lot of resistance to growth in Des Moines. Uh, and everybody, 
around the state thought that they needed to grow too. And so we were always in constant competition with the rest of the judicial branch for resources. So there was always an ongoing negotiation. Uh, and we started off with, uh, as you will recall, a juvenile referee. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Larry Eisenhower, George, Glenn Pilly was the referee when I became yeah. uh, And uh, then Judge Eisenhower. Judge. Later, uh, uh, Glenn was appointed to the district court and Larry Eisenhower became the referee. And we also had a district associate judge who did juvenile, that was Vince Hanrahan back in the day. Yeah. And those were the two juvenile court judges. And the caseload exceeded their ability to, to, to manage it. And so you became part of a program of part-time uh, juvenile referees. But I think you were able to, if I were, and I'm, help me here, I'm, but I think you were able to combine how many magistrates you were entitled to under the, under the census to right. into, into a, an associate district court judge, is that what you That did? started with uh, Judge Moore and I continued the practice of doing that. And, and uh, we uh, combined magistrates that we were entitled to uh, into uh, district associate judges. Just so our listener understands this, the, the census would tell you you were entitled to say three magistrates. Right. And then you were able to say that is the equivalent of an associate judge right. or something like that? Right. And then under statute, there's a statutory procedure for ah. conversion of the three magistrates into a, a full-time judge. I see. Okay. And that was always difficult to convince the court to do because with the full-time judge comes a full-time court reporter and staff. Uh, and you need a, a courtroom. So first you have to go to the county and, and secure the, the uh, uh, facilities because the state's response always was, well, we're not going to give you any judge because you don't have any place to put them. Uh. So we'd, we'd get caught in between the county and the, and the state uh, legislature in terms of uh, growth. So over time, we continued to convert magistrates into district associate judges, and the district associate judges did the magistrate's caseload, which was traffic and small claims. Um, and, uh, and they did it here in the courthouse until we finally outgrew that. Then we created a facility, a, a rental facility. Um, kind of River Heights or what, River or something? Right, on, on uh, Southwest 7th, River yeah. Place. Yeah. And we built some courtrooms in there, yes. so we'd have more room for growth and we continued to grow. So we did that. At the same time, the uh, juvenile court caseload was growing. And so we had, by that time, uh, converted or transitioned the old county referees to state court judges called associate juvenile judges and we had two of those and then we started assigning uh, uh, district associate judges to the juvenile docket actually we assigned dis district judges to the juvenile docket All judge right. reed did it judge hansen did it and, and until we had enough district associate judges to take that load so the district judges could do their work and we continued to grow and we outgrew our facility and that's that's why we needed it. We also were the only uh, district that had a probate judge for a while? Well, when I started as an attorney, we had a probate referee who was a county employee. Ed Fitzgerald. You Fitzger recall Ed? Ed Fitzgerald, Remember Ed? yeah. Yep. And Ed was the referee, and his office was always up on the fourth floor in the, in the, yep. uh, uh, of the Polk County Courthouse. And when Ed retired, uh, Ruth Klotz became the referee. Uh, and um, through my work with, with the Iowa Judges Association, one of, when I became president of the association, one of my projects was to convert those referees, they were juvenile referees and, and uh, probate referee, into state court judges within the judicial retirement system. And we successfully did that. So they, Ruth became a, a district associate judge equivalent. She was an associate probate judge. And what that meant to, to people like me, not only was she terrific, very good at it, uh, but under the old system, as a referee, you would get an order signed by the referee, then you'd have to take it to a district court judge right. to, to get it approved before you could right. file her. Because she was a referee. And she was a ref when she was a ref. But then when she became a judge, that, that part of it f f right. uh, fell away, and so you were able to do that. And, and the other thing about it is that uh, appeals from her court prior to that time went yeah. to the district judge. 
if I remember correctly. That's right. Uh, appeals from a associate probate judge Klotz went to the uh, appellate courts, and so that was a big time saver as well for good, the. Good luck with one of those. Uh, <laughs> well, the time saver for the district judge. No, judges. but I mean, she was really good, and I don't yeah, think appeals was. worked very well no, for her, uh, which which made it good, and uh, and she became a fixture here for many years, and I think you were probably responsible for um, eliminating the age limit for her? I think that uh, maybe I was. I don't think actually I was. I was responsible probably in part at least for her becoming a, a state court judge. But it was really the bar uh, <laughs> and the bar's lobbyists that uh, uh, negotiated with the legislature a, uh, we call it a grandmother clause for <laughs> Ruth <laughs> yes. uh, on her uh, mandatory retirement age. Well, I think all that's part of, of, of your administration in the sense that she, she was really very good at what she did yes. and, and hanging on to her was a good thing. Yes. So, all right. We're, well, um, we're covering a lot of the administrative stuff. I don't know that I've covered everything I, I'd like, uh, like to talk about, but uh, courtroom security became right an issue that you addressed right. as well. You yes. used to be able to walk in here, uh, not only get your license plates without, <laughs> without going through any security back in the good old right. days, I guess, but at what point did you decide you needed more security here? Well, uh, there was a proliferation of gun incidents in the courthouse in the 90s. Uh, and uh, Judge Moore was the chief. And we decided that we really did need uh, airport style security in Polk County uh, because of that. Uh, and he negotiated with the uh, Polk County Board of Supervisors to begin scre screening for weapons at the door uh, here in the courthouse. Uh, and it was literally airport style security uh, because it was the same. Uh, metal detection. Metal detectors and Huntley uh, Security Services, okay. a, a private uh, security firm. Mm. When I became chief, we developed some problems with the, the Huntley security, uh, and I, I determined that it was necessary that uh, security be more professionalized in Polk County. And I also had an interest in courthouse security for the rest of our district and statewide. So uh, we convinced uh, Polk County that uh, the statutory duties of the Sheriff's Department included bailiff services and that the court could order uh, the sheriff to perform uh, security at the courthouse if, if that became necessary and we negotiated it and we worked it out and uh, the uh, sheriff's department took over the screening duties at the door and increased the security level um, and, uh, uh, and also the uh, efficiency and professionalism of, of that type of uh, arrangement when you're greeting the public and people coming through the doors. Was that well received? Did you have much it trouble? It was a difficult transition. Uh, it was not well received when we started it, uh, particularly by the lawyers who didn't feel like they should have to go through security, but we determined that everybody who comes through the door needs to go through security. I mean, you can't have a, a favored. Uh... Mm -hmm. One of the incidents that occurred, though, was um, that led to the higher level of professionalism is that the, the court the policy was to allow knives, not guns, but we'd allow knives. And one time uh, up in the uh, fourth floor in room 412 or 413, family law, uh, senior Judge Oxberger was presiding and a guy pulled a knife in a heated uh, family law proceeding. And he didn't attack the judge or anybody else, but he slit his wrist and blood went everywhere. Yeah. And I was a never waste a good crisis. I was able to negotiate based on that, that we needed to uh, tighten security a little bit so that people couldn't bring knives into the building. And, and eventually security tightened. Uh, we uh, obtained uh, duress alarms for all the chambers and the benches for security incidents that, that occur in courtrooms. They actually do happen. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, in most of our courtrooms, we went from books stacked behind the benches as... Uh, Judge Alan Pearson in Dubuque was always the... <laughs> to a more yeah. you know, ballistic material behind benches. So that was in Polk County, and we spread that 
throughout our district and eventually the court uh, appointed me as the chair of uh, the state uh, Supreme Court uh, Committee on Court Security and we develop protocols for the state to implement statewide. Uh, and of course all of that costs money so then we had to come up with plans for uh, funding which never really took off but we made some proposals for funding. And ultimately the funding came down on, as an unfunded mandate on counties. Mm. Uh, and then in the later years, uh, we, for, for one thing, we had a terrible incident in Madison County uh, that did not have screening at the door. A uh, person brought a gun in, pulled a gun at sentencing, and, and, for, and I think the gun was discharged, but nobody was shot. Uh, but it became a big incident, and, and we started to require, as a result of that incident, a deputy in the, in the courtroom in most of those counties like that, at all times that court was in session so that a deputy could respond in, in real time to an incident like that. Did, did courtroom security uh, in the, other than Polk County in the district, did it tighten up after you did this in Polk County or? Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it took the, the statewide initiative to do it. Uh, I know Dallas well, County has that kind of. Right. right. Uh, and Warren perhaps too. Well, uh, Warren, yeah. right. right. Um, uh, uh, other districts do it as well in their in their higher volume courthouses. So yeah, I mean it it started from zero security, none back in the day, mm -hmm. none, particularly in the rural uh, settings yeah. where you talk about the farm crisis. You know there was times when you'd, you'd like to have a little security, uh, and you could call the sheriff, you could call nine one one, but the response times were varied because yeah. a lot of times. Uh, but little resources they had may have been in the jail or on patrol, so. It always seemed to me that any place where emotions run high, you need that kind of security. Criminal law, family law is just as, could be just as volatile. Juvenile. Juvenile, all those just mm -hmm. create emotions that cannot be right. controlled sometimes. Right. So that's, that was a, a big development and, and something again that took years to do, but uh, uh, obviously now in the, in the Polk County facilities, security is pretty tight. Uh, and uh, we feel pretty safe in these uh, courtrooms. I mean, our, our sheriff's department just does a, a wonderful job. Well, aside from uh, physical security, there's also kind of uh, ecological security in the sense that courtrooms have to be uh, free of asbestos and, and things like that. And did you get involved in that as well in this, uh, in this district? Yes, uh, both in the Polk County Courthouse and uh, in other facilities, Warren, in particular, uh, in Indianola. Um, major facilities issues in Dallas County, in the historic Dallas County Courthouse. Uh, Marion County and Knoxville. But here in Polk County, um, you know, we had rats in the basement. Um, we had bugs. Cockroaches large enough to saddle them up and ride them. <laughs> uh, we had uh, asbestos, mold, all kinds of environmental issues that were problems with this building that needed to be remediated. Now they have been, but uh, again, all those things took, took years to, to resolve. All those things got postponed because they didn't want to have to re remodel, I mean, face the remodeling of the place. Is that? Well, one of the things that happened is I was presiding in uh, criminal number one, which was um, in the, on the second floor in the center courtroom, the, the main criminal court. And I was sitting in my office one time, and a guy came in, and I said, he just walked in, who are you? He said, I'm the guy to remove this here asbestos. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> I haven't heard anything about that, and I didn't know anything about asbestos in the courthouse, and you're not going to do that until I have a chance to talk to the county. So he left, and I come back the next day, literally come back to the office the next day, and there's white powder uh. everywhere. And, the, and what had happened is the person had a contract with the county, and he went ahead and performed his contract, but he didn't do it very well, and uh, p white powder escaped all over the... Uh, judges' chambers and back into the court reporter's office. My, my court reporter, Becky Tierney. And uh, so, of course, I hit the ceiling and, and we had a series of bad meetings. 
about that. <laughs> and uh, the long and short of that was there was a, a large scale asbestos remediation project that occurred in, in the courthouse, unconnected to what we're doing now in terms of construction. But uh, because we, there was asbestos, uh, and uh, the white powder, powder was determined to be asbestos, and there was white powder in other places in the building, that uh, the county stepped up and, and did a, a fairly extensive and expensive uh, asbestos remediation. Similar things happened in, in uh, Marion County, not Marion, uh, Warren County, in Enola. You made some headlines there, I think, once in a while. I did. Uh, we had asbestos problems there. Um, there was mold problems were the primary problems. Uh, water infiltration from the roof and through the jail, which is on the fourth third, floor of fourth the building. Floor, top third floor, yeah. floor, top floor. And the inmates would plug the toilets on purpose and then water would come down rushing through the chambers and eventually mold would grow and it smell. And then one time, one of those incidents occurred and there was a flooding of the judges' chambers and the uh, carpet had to be torn up and in doing that, some tile had been removed from the floor and that was tested and determined to be asbestos. So uh, that began a long series of difficult meetings with the Warren County Board of Supervisors about court facilities in Warren County that ultimately years later led to uh, my decision to, uh, I couldn't close the building, but to refuse to do court there anymore because of the environmental issues, primarily uh, water infiltration and mold in that building. Uh, and that created a crisis in Warren County that ultimately led to a bond issue. And a crisis you took advantage of, huh? Well, I mean, it's not of my own making. No. But uh, <laughs> it, it's, it, it, you have to, sometimes wait until, in government, uh, wait until the, the, the thing you've been telling them is gonna happen finally occurs before government will act. And, and all this was on the job training. You didn't, weren't, weren't trained to do any of this, right? This is true. <laughs> I, I pretty much uh, learned it myself. Did you have any time to be a judge when all this is going well, on? Well, uh, Lou Laparato was the chief when I came and I observed how difficult it was for him to carry a full assignment and, and be chief as well on top of it. Uh, it was less of an issue for Judge Moore because he had a rural assignment and he could, he could manage that a little bit better and work around it. Um, so when I became chief, I was in Polk County. We were understaffed as far as uh, the judiciary was concerned and I didn't feel it was appropriate for me to do less so I carried a full assignment and, and worked as the chief on top of it. And pretty much did that throughout, although in my later years, uh, the, being chief became basically more than a full-time job and it was overwhelming. So uh, I think administration started to cover for me a little bit more in my later years. <laughs> All right, and did you, so in being a judge, did you uh, s subject yourself to the same rotation we're talking yes. about here? Yes. So you did a stint at, at criminal uh, oh, yeah. and, and civil and... Right. Uh, family law. Okay, and family law, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, did, were there many jury trials in the, in the rural areas when you were... Yeah, there were. There were um, primarily criminal uh, jury trials, but yeah, there were civil jury trials as well. Uh, and uh, you know, usually big cases was when they went to trial. Uh, but yeah, we, we did a full array of jury trials and of course the criminal, excuse me, the rural courts are general jurisdiction trial courts and the judges do everything. They don't, they don't have the luxury of a rotation or a specialization at least for a year or two at a time. They do everything. Uh, and so one day you're doing court service day and the next day you start a family law trial and maybe the next day you start a civil jury trial. So yeah. So it's just <clears throat> more than what I'd call the court service day. Um, in between, you do a court service day in the rural areas on, on Mondays and Fridays, and sometimes in between, if, but, and then try to do the trial work the, the, the days in between. Is right, it, right. <clears throat> and did that work pretty well? It did, but it became to the point where there was so much court service work to be done because of the expansion of the dockets uh -huh. and the increase in filings and the number of judges we had 
that uh, we had to establish additional court service days. So there would be, you know, Monday and Tuesday maybe in Jasper County, and Thursday and Friday in another mm -hmm. county, like Dallas. Mm -hmm. But okay. uh, so we had to work around that, and, and, and that created the need for additional courtrooms in, in Dallas County, and Warren County. Okay. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about interesting cases. Can, do you want to break them down by when, when they, when you were in the rural area as opposed to Des Moines, or how would you like, how would you like to discuss them? Well, some of my first cases that I had, of course, were in the rural courts when I was the least experienced and equipped to handle them. Um, and then you're uh, a fast learner. Well, I didn't have much choice. My, my sales pitch when I applied for the job was maybe I don't have as much experience as, as the next person, but I work hard and I study and, and, and I can manage it. And, and that's how I did manage it. Okay. Any, any of those particular cases that you did in the rural areas stick in your mind as uh, you well, like to talk about? Uh, one of my first major civil jury trials was uh, a uh, automobile accident case in Union County in Creston. Uh, it was a tragic case. I think the name of it was uh, Cox versus um, Creston Sanitation Incorporated. They were the garbage company in Creston. And what happened was a uh, pickup truck operated, owned by the sanitation company and operated by an employee, uh, ran over a child on a bicycle mm. uh, you know, on, on a busy street in Creston. And uh, Lex Hawkins and Glenn Norris had the plaintiff. The child was uh, terribly injured and paralyzed but not killed. Uh, and so the, the uh, projections for the cost of care through the child's life were huge, huge money at, at the time in the 80s in Union County. Uh, and Whitfield firm here in Des Moines defended that case, uh, Jerry Spath and Dave Phipps, if I remember correctly. And, uh, you know, Lex was at the peak of his uh, career as a trial attorney in those days. He was really good, uh, but difficult to deal with and get along with. <laughs> and uh, the trial was highly contentious, to say the least, in um, Creston. And uh, ultimately what occurred in the case is uh, that uh, we did a, a special verdict form for the jury with the questions of, I think, com comparative fault probably applied by that time. Uh, and question number one was, was the defendant at fault? And question number two, uh, did the fault of the defendant cause injury or damage to the plaintiff? Mm -hmm. And then we would get into the amount of damages if those were answered yes. And the amount of damages were in the millions, five, six, seven million dollars. Um, and the jury came back with this odd verdict where they refused to answer question number one on fault and answered question number two, no, no causation. So I called Lex, and I don't know, it's before cell phones, I mean, this was a long time ago. And I don't know how I got a hold of him, but I called him on his, on his way back to Des Moines. And I reported this odd verdict to him and asked him what he wanted to do about it. He said, uh, discharge the jury, we're beat. And that was the end of it. So I went in, discharged the jury, no appeal. The, the jury determined, I think, that the child darted out in front of the mm -hmm. truck and uh, there was nothing <laughs> the driver could do. And, and Lex knew that was a possibility and that's the way the verdict came in. And, that, and, and just as professional about it as he could be. Oh. I should have prefaced the beginning of this is that I did look at Westlaw and uh, they reported your name at, in 298 cases. <laughs> so uh, the, not all of them are, of course, went all the way. You would have been involved in a motion to suppress or something like that than a case that got appealed. But that does show you the, the range of, of cases you had in these period of time, that that right. many would, would be uh, reported as right. having some kind of appellate uh, uh, a component to the, um, so uh, you did a lot of work in the in the trenches as a as a as a trial yeah. judge. Yeah. Uh, after that one, and uh, any others you'd like to talk about in the rural areas, or when you get to Polk County? Well, we could talk all day about cases. And I, I know. could tell war stories all day. I, I know. Uh, one that I thought was interesting was, uh, I think I was still a rural judge, but it was a Polk County case, and it was uh, a. Uh, really heinous child sex abuse 
case involving a defendant by the name of Orly Farnham, who was tried over across the hall in what was then Judge Bergeson's courtroom. And uh, Nan Horvat prosecuted that case. And, uh, Eric Borseth defended it. You remember, you know, Eric. Um, and it was just a horrible case. It was also a case involving exhibition of pornographic material to minors. And uh, one of my mentors, I had several, but one of them when I was down here in early, my early days on the bench was Pete Donato. And I went to lunch with Pete and some of the good old boys that were on the bench back in the day. To Babes? Or to Babes. Yeah. <laughs> and we went to lunch at Babes and I was telling Pete about this case, particularly concerned about the pornography part about it and how I manage that. And it was a trial to the court, but uh, it garnered a lot of uh, press attention, including a register reporter who was monitoring the trial. And Pete, I don't think he was pulling my leg. I think he meant this seriously, but it became a real problem. Pete said, you know, there's a whole box of uh, pornographic movies, a whole box of them. And he said, you know what, you're going to have to watch every minute of every one of those to mm -hmm. determine if they were obscene materials or pornographic. Because if you don't, then the, the defendant will come back later and he'll say, well, some of those had uh, serious literary and artistic value yeah. and they weren't obscene materials and uh, could get a lead to a reversal if you don't do it. So I had to figure out how I was going to do that. And what I decided was that, you know, this main court, one of the main courtrooms on the third floor of the courthouse with a big open window looking into the courtroom. I didn't think it would be appropriate to exhibit obscene materials in the courtroom. So we decided to take everything back into chambers and set up a, a projector. projector and a screen. And, and uh, so we did. And the register reporter thought that uh, we were lacking transparency, as, <laughs> as you would put it today. And uh, she demanded that she attend the uh, trial in chambers. I said, all right. So we had a female reporter, my female court reporter, Becky, female prosecutor, Nan Horvat. Um, and uh, I decided that uh, I was going to watch every single minute of every single movie, uh, unless and until the defendant stipulated that uh, they were all of the same nature and character that viewing them all in public uh, open court would not be necessary. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't do that. So we started with the first one, and it was a dirty movie, and it was obscene and pornographic, and it lacked any serious uh, literary or artistic value, to say the least. And it was a really pretty embarrassing situation. Finished that one, and uh, we started another one. I think we did another one. And we're going to do them all. And pretty soon the register reporter asked uh, if I would mind if she left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I found the defendant guilty of all of the offenses and sentenced him to like 96 years in prison. Good heavens. Uh, which uh, Judge Critelli thought was a little harsh. <laughs> well, maybe you can watch some movies while he's there. Mm -hmm. uh, OK, I know you did uh, a couple of trials out of town on changes of venue. There's one in Sioux City involving a Union County, uh, County Deputy Sheriff, was it? Yes. Uh, I, and, I took a, a case uh, when I was a rural judge out of Jasper County, a murder case, uh, to Sioux City and was familiar with the facilities up there and, and how that all worked. And, and I was, of course, back, that was the first trial that we took up there was before the internet. And so it was outside of the Des Moines media market and. You know, they didn't really pay much attention to our cases up there. and It was a good place to go. Uh, by the time I took the Union County Sheriff's, uh, well, Union County uh, Crescent Cops case. Crescent Cops, excuse me. To uh, Woodbury County, um, uh, it was less so because of the internet. And, and people were familiar with the uh, Crescent situation because it received a lot of publicity. My uh, dealings and my management of the press evolved over time. And maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, maybe if we could go, before we go to the Crescent Cops case, I'd like to talk about the uh, State versus Bobby, jo Bobby Lee Smith 
trial. And this Bobby, is your this is your interview, sir. You can do what you wish. Bob's uh, Nan the Nancy Zigemeyer rape trial. All right. And that by the time I did that case, I was a Polk County judge. And uh, Judge Catelli was in the courtroom we're in now, and this case was tried in, uh, directly across the hall uh, in, uh, in what was a, a cobbled up courtroom. It was one of the smaller ones, yeah. it was room 305 at the time. And Nancy Ziegenmeyer uh, was the victim of a, a terrible kidnapping and rape uh, case. And uh, she had determined that there was a stigma attached to rape victims and uh, that she wanted to contribute towards ending that stigma. And so she had uh, been in contact with the Des Moines Register and prior to that time the Register did not publish the name of rape victims and the police department kept their names confidential. And Nancy felt that, was, that stigmatized victims and wanted some publicity. And I was a little uncomfortable with that because uh, while I was sensitive to the needs of crime victims, I had a trial to run and due process to provide to um, the defendant. And there was a lot of pretrial publicity on this case. So uh, the register, we had uh, expanded media coverage and cameras in the courtroom by that time. The register had made a mistake in, in their filing. Uh, for notice of expanded media coverage, and I took advantage of that to limit their expanded media coverage because I didn't want excessive publicity in the courtroom during this rape trial. And one of the uh, features of this particular case was Nancy had uh, been uh, carjacked in a parking lot uh, at DMAC and moved from that location to another location where she was raped and a ring that she was wearing was stolen. And the police had found the ring uh, or found that it had been sold out of a pawn shop and connected the ring through the defendant's wife or girlfriend to the defendant back to Nancy and that's what led them to the defendant. But Nancy had trouble identifying the defendant, so this became one of the first uh, trials uh, in the country, and particularly in Iowa, uh, where DNA, DNA identification was used, which had led to a lot of delay in the case before I got it. So then, when I took over the case, there was this issue of DNA identification and Nancy's ability to identify the defendant. Uh, and I made some rulings uh, about the admissibility of DNA uh, and that the prosecutor and the victim didn't particularly agree with. And one of the things that happened during the course of the trial is Nancy's ability to recall the identity of the defendant uh, improved. And so she was on the witness stand testifying across the hall in one of these courtrooms that had a, a clear glass door um, and was beginning to testify and it got to the point where I did, uh, her identification of the defendant and as from the witness stand she pointed to the defendant and about that time I'm looking out the window into the hall and I see Judge Critelli come out of this courtroom and he's chasing somebody down the hall <laughs> so, he was a large man, if you remember. Uh, yes, I do. So I declared a recess to figure out what the ruckus was about and what it was. was the register reporter had set up outside of Judge Patelli's courtroom, and he was using a telephotic le telephoto oh, to go. lens to go in to the courtroom and take pictures of Nancy while she was testifying on the stand. So we had a big. Uh, rhubarb about that and I brought the reporter in and there, uh, then the photographer and was considering contempt of court uh, proceedings because I told them not to do that and not to have standard media coverage and he was saying well I'm in, entitled to do this I was out in the hall mm -hmm. I wasn't in the courtroom so we went round and round about that and I decided to 
uh, scold the reporter and the, and the uh, photographer, but not to do anything about it. So the ca case went on, came a uh, guilty verdict. Uh, the defendant was sentenced to life in prison. Um, and Nancy uh, went on after that, Nancy Zigemeyer, to become a uh, advocate for victims of rape cases and was on virtually every media outlet talk show you can be on. It led to a book deal and a movie contract and it was a huge deal. Well, the register was, was very much part of that and uh, one day I'm sitting in chambers and uh, Geneva Oberholzer came in. She was the editor of the Des Moines Register. Yes. She later went on to become, you know, uh, a, a big wig in the Washington Post and the New York Times. That's right, yeah. But Geneva Oberholzer came to see me. She said, uh, you know, I know that uh, we may have violated some rules here, but uh, I've got these pictures and I want to show them to you and I want your permission to publish them. She showed me these pictures that they had taken, very dramatic pictures of the victim, Nancy Ziegenmeyer, pointing out the defendant, really good pictures. And I said to, to uh, Ms. Overholzer that, look, uh, they knew I didn't want them taking pictures of the court proceedings. And I scolded them about that and, and they stopped doing it. Um, but I didn't seize their film. I didn't hold them in contempt. You've got the pictures. You're going to have to decide what to do. With them. So they published them. And they wrote this long series of, of articles about uh, the stigma of rape victims in Nancy Ziegenmeyer's trial. And ultimately, they went on to win the Pulitzer Prize. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so I went from you know, allowing a registered reporter to come back into chambers uh, to dealing with the Nancy Ziegenmeyer case to the Creston Cops case, where in Creston we had expanded media coverage. And what occurred was I get a call from the media coordinator um, in Union County just really mad and upset because she had a notice of expanded media coverage on file and the judge, whoever it was, uh, uh, tricked her and went ahead with a proceeding and arraignment without her and uh, on purpose, according to her, allegedly. And uh, she was mad because there was supposed to be uh, expanded media coverage in the proceeding. Mm -hmm. It was the arraignment of the police chief of the Crescent Police Department charged with sexual abuse in the second degree uh, and the assistant chief. Uh, and the judge cooperated with the <coughs> defendants and the Union County Sheriff, who was friends with the chief, and assistant chief, to avoid the, that press coverage. And then they allegedly uh, assisted the defendant in leaving out the back door of the courthouse to avoid publicity, which is all uh, not the way it was supposed to go as far as I was concerned. So rather than reassign that case to anybody else, I decided that I'm the chief. I've got the one that's got the problem with it, I'm going to take that case. So I assigned that case to myself, and I went down and started dealing with that case. And eventually, the state moved for change of venue mm. because the state was not feeling they could get a fair trial in an environment where the county sheriff, the court's bailiff, was assisting the defendant. And, and sitting behind the defendant or sitting with the defendant at the council table and so forth. And so I granted the change of venue and we moved it to Woodbury County based on my experience with that. And we had the Woodbury County Sheriff take over security for the proceeding. And Union County Sheriff and deputies were allowed to attend, but they were spectators and they were not to be in uniform. And we dealt with the expanded media coverage there. Um, and. Uh, we tried the case, expanded media coverage, and the case was submitted late in the afternoon, and one of the jurors had non-refundable airplane tickets that for the next week, uh, or within a couple days of the trial ending. So it was the practice in Woodbury County that the judge would babysit the jury into the evening if they were close to a verdict, and I kept getting told by this jury they were, they were gonna come back with a verdict. 
So ultimately, the jury returned a verdict at 10 o'clock at night in the Woodbury County Courthouse, and it happened to be live on uh, KCCI News because <laughs> the cameras were there and the jury came back and lead uh, at 10 o'clock, the 10 o'clock news. Wow. And that was an interesting transition of how my view of expanded media coverage changed over the course of my career. And then a final thing that happened was we did the sentencing here in Polk County because it was convenient for everyone. And I it was one of these big courtrooms on the third floor down the hall and I come out and there's a, a, a trooper or a sheriff's deputy and a bomb dog or weapon sniffing dog of some kind. What are you guys doing here? Well, we're um, making sure the courtroom is clear for the sentencing. Well, why? I haven't received any threats or anything. I said, well, um, after you left the courthouse, maybe even while you were leaving the courthouse in uh, Sioux, City? Sioux City at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night by the time I left, the, uh, one of the defendant's brother was observed pulling a gun. And I didn't know anything about it. Nobody told me. I said, nobody told me that. I couldn't believe it. So yeah, go ahead with your uh, work here in the courthouse. <laughs> and we secured the proceeding and we did the sentencing. They wow. got a very severe uh, sentence. Wow, that's, that's a pretty good story, I'd say. Uh, OK. Um, let's take a break here. OK. Well, Judge Gamble, one of the things we have yet to speak about is your uh, participation in the Judges Association in Iowa. Can you tell us uh, how all that began and then what it, how, how it, how it uh, occurred? Well, I was interested in uh, judicial salaries and benefits going on the bench as a young uh, lawyer. And uh, when I uh, interviewed for the job... Tell me how much you started at. I started at $50,700. That's what the salary was when I first started. And that's actually about what I was making as an attorney when I came across uh, yeah. and over to the bench. Governor Branstad, who was interviewing me, was, he, I was 30, he was 36. So it was uh, a different time. Yeah. Uh, and he was appointing a lot of, of younger judges in their 30s back in those days, primarily because the salary was what it was and, and the competition for uh, judgeships wasn't maybe what it became later in my career. But uh, he asked me in my interview, now is this salary going to be a problem for you because you have uh, a, a lot higher earning capacity as an attorney than, than you would have as a judge and are you going st to stick this out and, and be a judge or are you just doing this to build your resume and go back into practice? Essentially was his question or at least the point he was concerned about. A good question, fair question. It was a fair question and my answer was I think that the salaries will take care of themselves. I just left it at that. Um, and then after I was appointed as a young uh, judge, I attended various educational programs, and one of them was uh, a program put on by one of the bar associations, I think, and uh, Chief Justice uh, Ward Reynoldson was the speaker. And he kind of singled me out during his speech about judicial salaries and the trend towards younger lawyers coming on the bench and uh, the concern that salaries weren't going to keep up and these people would leave the bench and go back into practice. And I didn't feel that that was very fair either. I mean, I had given up private practice in a, a substantial, I think, earning capacity to, to go on the bench, but I was committed to being on the bench at least for a, a good long term. And uh, it just got me interested in judicial salaries and benefits. And I was a member of the Iowa Judges Association, and, uh, and Lou Labrado, our chief, was, uh, I think, legislative co-chair with um, Court of Appeals Judge Barney Donaldson, who was uh, the legislative liaison with the Iowa Judges Association. And you knew Barney, and he, Barney was a schmoozer. He, he really was. He was excellent at what he did. He was a great guy. And when Lou went on the Supreme Court, I think I've got my timing right, but about that time anyway, uh, I became a legislative co-chair with Barney. And Barney be then became one of my mentors and took me under his wing and helped me learn the ropes of dealing with the uh, legislature. 
and we uh, had a campaign that occurred over a series of years that focused in on judicial salaries and pension benefits and uh, compared our uh, what we thought were relatively low salaries at the time uh, compared to other states around the country uh, and uh, convinced the legislature that in order to attract quality lawyers to the bench and retain the quality judges that we had, that it was important to keep the salaries competitive and, and to raise salaries. And, and we were able to increase salaries in fits and starts and over the years uh, to become more competitive. Uh, and uh, after Barney retired, uh, I became chair of the legislative committee of the Iowa Judges Association. And I brought on uh, John Nara, who later became chief judge of the seventh district, uh, as my co-chair. And we developed uh, a, another uh, program uh, to continue that. Um, and we had a series of presidents through the time, including uh, uh, Tony Curtelli, who was president. And Tony's view of it was, we need to get a big uh, salary increase to become competitive. But we, we, what would occur was we would get a big raise, and then our salaries would be frozen for a series of years. And inflation would occur, and the purchasing power of that salary would go down. Another crisis. And another a crisis would occur. Yeah. And when we get another raise, and then that would, it was just an ongoing cycle, and yeah. Tony's view was that we needed to get that and then tie ourselves to the rate of inflation of salaries that our uh, staff was getting, because they were getting regular raises. Some of them were union represented, and they, they'd get raises, cost of living increases and so forth, but we didn't get that, and it would cause us to fall behind. So we did a kind of a combination of that and trying to keep ourselves hooked up to uh, state employees, uh, salary increases and so forth. Over the course of years, our salary went from 50,000 to 100,000. And uh, now, of course, I'm not involved with it anymore, but now it's 150,000. So we were able to substantially increase judicial compensation uh, over the course of many uh, years. And you also worked on the pension. And we worked on the pension, and when I became a judge, the, the pension was 50% of a judge's salary after 17 and two-thirds years of service. And we were seeking ways to increase that <clears throat> amount of the pension benefit because 50% of $100,000 in retirement would be $50,000, and there were and there were judges that were not doing well financially. Uh, given their longevity, they might live till their 90s, and they didn't get any, any real increases in their, in their pension. It was a, a problem we needed to deal with. So the senior judge program provided some level of uh, inflation protection against the judge's uh, pension because if you were a senior judge for a series of, I think it was six years, you'd be vested in salary increases uh, you get the same raise as the uh, uh, judge would get in your pension and take care of your. And at some point, did the retirement age lower then? <laughs> so the retirement age lowered to 72. Uh, and uh, that may have been before I came on the bench, but it was 72, which is pretty young. Uh, when you're talking about judges who maybe came on the bench later in life, then had to retire when they were 72 and might live to be 92. Uh, so that inflation protection became important. And one time, uh, the, the, the legislature decided that uh, that senior judge program was just too rich and it cost too much money. And so they cut that inflation protection. And uh, Lou was uh, on the Supreme Court by then. I was chair of the legislative committee, and we had to fight that back. And so we dealt with the um, legislature, and particularly it was a uh, uh, Polk County legislator, Dottie Carpenter, that was behind it. And we convinced her that that, that was really not a good idea for uh, both attracting judges to the bench, because they need to know they're going to have financial security in their older, year, older years, and also for our retired judges who had served uh, such a long time. Uh, and we convinced a <clears throat> the legislature to give us uh, not, you know, 
percentage point by percentage point of increases to protect the pension from inflation, but 75% of a point ongoing uh, through the senior judge program. And in addition, uh, we convinced the legislature to uh, uh, pay a salary or a stipend to the senior judges of $8,000 a year. And uh, it was one of these deals where we made that proposal not thinking anyone would accept it, and it was readily accepted. So I told Lou, I said, but well, we didn't ask for enough. <laughs> but that, that protects our pension, and then... Uh, Don't the, look back. The pensions then, uh, the years of service went from 17 and two-thirds to 25 years, and you continued to become vested until you reached 25 years of service, which a lot of us as younger judges w yeah. were able to do and we retired with 65% of salary today. So we, we really did improve judicial compensation from <clears throat> the time I went on the bench to the time that I retired. And as a uh, recognition of all this work, they gave you an award, I think. Well, I was uh, legislative co-chair for a series of years, and then I was president, and then uh, the great uh, job of being immediate past president of an association. And then uh, a few years after that, they gave me the Award of Merit for from the Iowa Judges Association. For all that uh, work. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well deserved. Uh, but even well deserved as that is, there was another well deserved award uh, from the Inns of Court for the Eighth Circuit uh, Professionalism Award right. here in uh, Des Moines. Uh, right. I guess three years ago now? Probably three years ago. Yeah. One of them. One of the real honors about that is that I think one of the moving forces behind that was Judge Colin Witt. Absolutely. Uh, and Colin uh, was president of the uh, C. Edwin Moore American Inns of Court at the time, and I had been a member since the beginning uh, and had been through the chairs as counselor and then president of the inn for two years uh, and stayed with the inn throughout. And in recognition of that, I guess, uh, Colin, when he was president, organized uh, my application, unbeknownst to me, to be uh, named uh, uh, to the Eighth Circuit uh, uh, Professionalism Award for the American Inns of Court. He did it in about a week. Did he really? Yeah. I didn't know anything about it. I get a call one time from a, a federal judge that I did not know. <laughs> and I take this call and she tells me that uh, I've received this award, and it's a very prestigious award and everything like that, which I didn't know anything about it. Well, not only was there a mention <coughs> here in Des Moines, you <coughs> were able to go to uh, Washington, D.C. Tell us about that. Well, um, when I was uh, counselor to the Inn when we first started as a chapter, I attended that dinner in Washington, D.C. It was a black tie event hosted by one of the uh, Supreme Court justices. At that time, it was Sandra Day O'Connor, and it was an awards dinner. And so at the end of my career, I was able to attend that dinner to receive the Eighth Circuit Professionalism Award uh, from um, uh, uh, one of the Supreme Court uh, Justices, Clarence Thomas, and it was presented by the Chief Judge of the Fifth Circuit. Uh, in the courtroom of the United States Supreme Court, uh, and then followed by a, a dinner in the, in the Great Hall of, of the Supreme Court. Uh, my wife attended and I invited my son Joe to attend uh, with us. Uh, to receive that award. It was a great experience. Fantastic. Well, well deserved, I would say, and a really good time. How did you educate four kids on a judge's salary anyway? <laughs> well, it was, it was difficult. Um, uh, I had uh, some uh, inheritance from my dad that helped uh, with college expenses for them. Uh, they all went to state schools. They all worked. They all pitched in, uh, and somehow Nancy and I made it work. All right. Um, have we covered everything you'd like to talk about here? Uh, anything more you'd like to say that, we, that I've missed in asking your questions? Or? Well, I think we could go on and on uh, all afternoon with war stories, and uh, I think that uh, it gets old after a while. I just want to thank uh, you and Mark for the opportunity to, to uh, do this. It's, well, this it's is our pleasure, and I, I would say on a, on a personal note, um, I think that the administration of justice in, in central Iowa owes you a, rem, a remarkable debt, or a large debt, for all the work you've done to make this darn system work and work properly and see that uh, 
everybody gets a fair shake uh, in front of uh, in front of the bench. And I personally want to thank you for all the work you've done. Oh, thank you. I'm very honored. Thank you. And uh, we have a uh, small tradition we do. We're going to take a picture. You stay seated there. Okay. Mark and I are going to stand behind you. So we're oh, okay. We just uh, make a record of who did this. That's since last July. Yeah. Mark done some jury trials. Yeah. Okay, so this is the this is the one thing I had to do here. Okay. I forgot my you hand. See there. Make sure that we're all right. We're looking okay here, so. All right, there. That's better. All right. All right. Yeah. Right there. Okay. That's enough. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're a free man. All right. Well, thank you very well, much. Don't forget your mic.